Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome by the European IP Help Desk and this BVO uh, today for uh, this uh, session that uh, we are going to carry out in cooperation. And we have the luck and the honor to have today here uh, our colleagues Montserrat Garcia Monco Fuente and Ankara Martinez Lopez uh, to carry out uh, this uh, lesson, which is going to be, I think, uh, very, very interesting for the whole audience. It's going to be the interface between uh, plant variety rights uh, and uh, patents. First of all, thank you very, very much, uh, Montserrat and uh, Angela, for uh, this uh, time that you have dedicated and uh, decided to spend uh, together with us. Before I leave you the word, however, uh, just let me take a, a couple of um, moments to introduce the European IP help desk uh, to our audience uh, and uh, to say a couple of words regarding the uh, administrative uh, part, the housekeeping of uh, this webinar today. You might have noticed that your uh, microphone is uh, switched off and uh, you're not able to speak uh, freely. That's because we expect to have around 60, 70 participants and it would be very hard for us to learn something if uh, there would be so many background noises. Therefore, we have muted all microphones, but that does not mean you're not welcome to ask questions. Actually, we encourage uh, our participants to do so. And in case you should have question at any time of the presentation, you can write them in the question part of the screen that you can see on the right hand side of your screen. I will gather all these questions and uh, I will create a word file later on uh, that uh, we are going uh, to share together and do our best, of course, to answer to all your questions. The most frequently asked question is when you will receive the slides and recording of today's presentation. And that's going to happen at the latest tomorrow morning. Hopefully, I'll be able to cut the video and send you the slide uh, this afternoon with also a couple of uh, useful links and information for your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Having said that, I would simply like to spend a couple of words uh, on the European IP Help Desk. Uh, we are a service initiative of the European Commission that has the objective of addressing current and potential beneficiaries of EU-funded projects, researchers and small and medium enterprises across the European Union, helping them uh, to use and uh, efficiently um, register uh, intellectual property rights uh, uh, and uh, therefore we do this uh, with the services you can see here on the right hand side from the cornerstone which is our website ec.europa.eu slash ip minus health desk and we offer trainings online like today in cooperation also with european agencies as much as we can uh, but also uh, on on site we hope that's going to be possible uh, to do it again in the nearest future we also have publications available online for your use completely free for download and you're free also to distribute it and use it as you uh, please. Uh, f uh, additionally, we have an ambassador scheme all across the European Union with ambassadors that can help you in your own language. And uh, finally, but probably most importantly, we have a helpline. The helpline is a pool of experts uh, that are waiting actually for uh, your uh, questions. They will answer to your questions, specific questions within three uh, working days. And you can ask your questions in different languages. We suggest, however, if possible, to ask your questions in English. All uh, the services are completely free of charge that we offer. The territory where we offer these services is the European Union plus a couple of uh, 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 connected uh, uh, states like Israel, uh, Norway or United Kingdom and so on and so forth. If you need uh, the very same services that uh, I have introduced to you in the previous slide, but for different geographical areas like China, India, Southeast Asia, Africa or Latin America, our colleagues from the different help desk are uh, going to be very happy to help you with that. The website is the same. We have been embedded all together in the European Commission uh, website and we operate centrally from there. I told you uh, that we have a, a website, offer trainings, provide publications and uh, also we have audiovisual content available on YouTube and uh, we are active on social media like uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. So if you'd like to discuss with us, we're very happy to operate on these grounds as well. Um, additionally, we have uh, 
an ambassador scheme uh, across the European Union, as I told you before. It covers uh, 28 uh, countries and we have more than uh, 20 and 47 uh, ambassadors. They are very specialized um, individuals in the field of intellectual property and intellectual property rights. Additionally, they are part of the Enterprise Europe network, meaning that can also help you uh, setting up um, commercial activities uh, or cooperation across uh, European Union, overcoming language barriers as well. Um, regarding the webinars that we offer, here is the very next upcoming sessions of uh, 2022 for the second part. We're going to go on until Christmas, so this is uh, uh, the very nearest uh, uh, appointments only that we have. If you check out our website, you're going to be able to see all of them and register to all of them. If you've lost some of uh, the previous sessions, like for example, yesterday's introduction to IP, uh, no worries about that because you can simply write us an email or visit the e-learning part of our website and you will have access to all the links uh, of our also past webinar. Otherwise, you can register to the next upcoming ones. Among the upcoming ones, there's uh, also the further collaboration with uh, the CPVO and COPORA and um, we are going to be very happy uh, of course to welcome you to all the next upcoming webinar in there as well and just like all the other webinars also the previous session with uh, CPVO and COPORA are uh, available for your view in case you might have uh, missed one of uh, uh, the previous upcoming webinar. And now I have um, carried out uh, the uh, introduction as fast as I could in order to provide the word uh, to my colleagues and not waste your precious uh, time, of course. And uh, Montserrat, I would uh, therefore give you uh, the word and uh, provide you with the, the control and set myself in uh, the background but just in case you should need some help and collaboration i will be here and i see your slides uh, so you can start with the presentation thank you very much once again for being thanks michele and uh, well welcome to everybody third thanks in the first place to the ip help desk for inviting us today to, to make this presentation on the interface between collaborative rights and patents. Uh, before getting into the, the subject, allow myself to present ourselves. So we have, uh, so we are today uh, here at my side, I have Mrs. Angela Martinez Lopez, who's a legal advisor at the CPVO. And myself, I'm Monse García Munco Fuente, head of the legal unit. Uh, Getting into the presentation after some important disclaimers, uh, today's presentation is going to, to be divided into the following points. We will start, I will start making an introduction to plant variety protection in the European Union, uh, and that will be followed by also an introduction to patent protection in Europe. Then Ms. Martinez Lopez will go on uh, with the interface, with the analysis of the interface between plant variety rights and plant related patents. And she will also analyze the most relevant case law of the Boards of Appeal of the European Patent Office. And I will finalize with uh, brief and final considerations. So getting into the, into, the, into the substance of today's presentation, I think it's important to start by explaining the, the value, highlighting the value of plant innovation. So uh, of course, products of plant breeding are of high value especially in the current times where we are confronted with uh, climate change and the effects that it has for agriculture. Uh, varieties need to be more resilient to, to, to stress linked to droughts, to heavy rains, uh, it, uh, more yield is necessary. So uh, this is of course in the interest of society. However, developing new plant varieties is time consuming and costly. Sometimes it might take to 15 or even 20 years to develop a new plant variety. And here companies, which by the way are mostly SMEs, invest up to already up to 20% of their annual turnover on research and development. So it's, it's important that future R D investment continues and even if possible increases, but this requires incentives. 
And it has been uh, agreed uh, in general that I feel it's, it's a good incentive as it allows a fair return on investment. IP, so intellectual property, provides for different tools that in order to protect uh, plant innovation. Uh, we have, we're going to talk today about PBRs and, and plant patents, of course, but there are also other IP rights uh, that can be used, like, for example, trademarks or trade secrets. The obligation to provide protection to plant varieties arises from the TRIPS agreement, uh, where it was established that, of course, the, the members of the World Trade Organization, they have an obligation to protect said, said plant varieties. And here, Article 27.3b of the TRIPS agreement uh, allow the members to choose between different possibilities. So they could choose between using patent law or creating a sui generis system or using a combination of both of them. So with this short introduction to the, to the need to protect and to the protection to plant varieties or to plant innovation, maybe even better, uh, I, get, I finally get to the, to the EU system. So the EU put in place uh, the Community Plant Variety Rights System, which uh, adopts the Sugenary System for Protection of Plant Varieties in line with the TRIPS Agreement. Uh, our legal basis, the main legal basis, is Council Regulation 2100-94 on community plant variety rights that we call our basic regulations. There are other implementing regulations as well. And the basic regulation is modeled and on and compliant with the of Convention, the Act of 91. Uh, and in fact, the European Union is member since 2005 of the of EUPOF. The and finally, also the CPVR system is managed by the Community Plan Variety Office, so the office where we are currently working. In fact, we are here. Here you can see a picture of Henri, where we are working. Nice picture. So we are an EU agency which is responsible for the management of the CPVR system. We have legal personality and we are competent for the granting and man management of the CPVR so the community plan variety rights. As I, as I said, uh, we have our seat in Angers in France, and we are operative since 95, 1995, and we're fully self-financed thanks to the fees that our um, that uh, applicants and title holders pay. Uh, we have more around and more a bit more of 55 employees of 14 EU nationalities, and we work in the 24. Uh, in 24 EU languages. We are under the authority of the Administrative Council of the CPVO, and we also have independent boards of appeal in cases our decisions are um, contested. So, one of the main peculiarities of the EU system is that it provides uniform effect or uniform protection throughout the EU territory, so the, the 27 member states, in line with what happened with the EU trademark or the EU design. But, well, maybe for those of you who might not be so well acquainted with the, with the plant variety world, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's good to start also with, um, with a definition of what is a plant variety. And here we have to refer to Article 5.2 of our basic regulation, where we have a definition of a variety. It's a plant grouping within a single botanical taxon of the lowest known rank, which can be defined by the expression of the characteristics of a particular genotype, so by the phenotype, which is also distinguishable from others in at least one characteristic, and that is considered as a unit that is suitable for propagating and change. So, of course, it might sound a bit complicated. In simple terms, we can say that a variety is the most specific tangible unit of organisms of the taxonomy of plant kingdom. But maybe even to make it even simpler or more clear, some pictures might be of help. So here you, you, you can see, uh, well, in the, in the vegetable sector, for example, different varieties of carrots. Uh, and of course, in the ornamental, you have those beautiful lilies there, but not only there, there's also in the, in the fruit sector, you can see maybe what is more well known. So in apples, the different varieties that you can that you can find in the market, and also in the agricultural sector, rice. So 
Uh, having said this, uh, and uh, advancing a probable question of which varieties can be protected, what varieties of all botanical genera and species, and species might be protected, and indeed we have received application for more than 2,300 plant species, which is not bad. So, what are the benefits of the application procedure for a CPVR? Well, basically, it's that with one application, uh, following one procedure, performing one technical examination, we reach a decision that provides, if it's a granting one, of course, that provides protection in the 27 EU member states. It's clear that the benefits that it has in, in as regard time, money, and even the management of the, of the application, well, they're, they're not insignificant. And further to that, anybody can apply. So that's that's uh, that uh, that is very positive, or in any case, for for the breeders. So very very shortly, the process of application. Just some ideas. Uh, we receive the application, and uh, it is registered, and then we do a formal and substantive examination, where we, for example, see the the novelty. We we'll check the novelty, the uh, nomination. Uh, then there is the technical examination. Here I want to stress the fact that we first we grow the variety, so we are really talking about living material, and this implies that we have to grow them to see if if, if they express the, the characteristic as as it is said in the application form in the technical questionnaire. So we grow them, but we don't do that in Uri, and would be impossible. So we have our own network of examination offices where they perform the technical examination depending on the species um, under the supervision of the CPDO. And finally, there is the decision to grant or refuse the application. The requirements for protection, there are five. Uh, the three first are the technical ones, so distinguished uniformity and stability. So first one is that the, the variety needs to be distinct from other varieties of common knowledge. So you have or white olives in the common knowledge, then this white olive with pink stripes that would be distinct. Uh, it could be considered distinct, just uh, of course in, in brief terms. Uniformity is that the, the variety needs to be uniform. For example, if we have the tulip and the white tulip with pink, um, pink stripes, and then when we cultivate it, then there is like one which is not uh, white and, and pink, but it's, for example, orange, and that might create a problem on the uniformity. And stability is that, well, it has to remain unchanged within the time. So it must, must be always remain with the same color, the same characteristics. That's a, a very brief, um, uh, that's very briefly description of what it means. Novelty. Novelty is linked to commercialization, meaning that the variety was has uh, was not uh, commercialized by the breeder with his consent in a certain period. So in the European Union, it's before earlier than one year to the application. Outside the European Union, it's four years, except when it gets to um, trees and vines, where the novelty is um, well, the required period is six years. And finally, uh, the variety needs to have an adequate variety denomination. The duration of the right, well, normally it's 25 years after the granting of the protection, the granting of the right, uh, but in some cases it can be 30 years in cases of vine trees and potatoes and very, since very recently this was extended to asparagus and the species that you can see in the screen. Uh, and there is also the possibility to have provisional protection since the publication of the application. Uh, getting to the scope of the right, so the, uh, it is required when the right is granted uh, from that moment on, uh, it is required the authorization of the co-holder to perform the following acts. So the production or reproduction of the material, the conditioning for purpose of propagation, the offering for sale or serving or other marketing, exporting, importing, or stocking for all the mentioned purposes. But uh, what it refers, no? These rights, they do apply to what? Well, the material scope of CPVRs, it's concrete. It's uh, one hand, uh, first of all, the variety constituents, 
which are the plants, which are plants or part of plants, which can be uh, propagated uh, and produce new plants. For example, seeds and uh, bulbs, even sometimes flowers. Harvested material is the product of the of the harvest, like the fruit uh, and that uh, fruit, uh, fiber, cereals. And just to mention that under very specific circumstances that normally don't happen, there's a possible protection to products obtained directly from material of the protected variety. Um, as any other IP right, there are exceptions and limitations to CPDRs. So further to the normal uh, private and non-commercial acts or acts done for experimental purposes, we have what it is called the cornerstone of our system, which is the breeder exemption. Which, uh, which is an exception that refers to acts done for breeding or discovering and developing new varieties. So, if, uh, if there is a protect, even if there is a protected variety, this variety can be used for breeding new varieties without the need of the authorization of the title holder. And finally, there is also what we call the agricultural exemption of farm safe seeds, which allows uh, the farmers to use propagating for propagating purposes in their own holdings the seeds that they have obtained by planting propagating material of a protected variety. So uh, to finalize on the PVR part, some statistics to have to give you some some numbers that might clarify even more what we are talking about. So in the almost 30 years that the uh, CPVO has been operative, we have received around 77,000 applications. Of those, 61,000 61, have been uh, granted, and almost half of it are currently enforced. So, not bad for us. So, as I mentioned, that was my last slide concerning the PVR system, the CPVR system. And now I'm going to make reference as well to to patent protection in Europe. Um, and here we have to refer again to TRIPS agreement, to Article 27 even, where it is said that patents shall be available for any invention, whether products or processes, in all fields of technology, provided that they are new, involve an inventive step, and are capable of industrial applications. So inventions in all fields of technology can be protected, and also we can have patents for products and processes. <coughs> I'm sorry. I have to say that there is no definition of what is an invention. So here you can find a proposal. So technical solution to a technical problem. Concerning the protection, you have different routes for patent protection. You can do that via the national patent offices in each country. Then there is a European one through the uh, European Patent Convention, that that's the one that we're going to talk about today. And then you have international, which is really not a system of protection as such. It's just a tool that allows uh, to um, apply for patent protection in different countries around the world. So facilitates the patent application procedure. So, as I was saying, uh, we are going to concentrate on the European Patent Convention, the European Patent System. Uh, the European Patent Convention was signed in Munich in 1973, and it established the Intergovernmental Organization, which is the European Patent Organization. The EPORC is composed of 38 contracting states, which include all European member states, but also other countries, like, for example, Norway, Switzerland, Turkey, for example. And the European Patent Office is the executive arm of the EPORC. Uh, the European Patent Office is responsible for examining applications and granting European patents, but it is important to highlight that it is not a EU institution. It is operative since 1973 and it's self-financed as well with their own fees. Uh, from what I've seen, they are almost 7,000 people working there. So it's really big, big, big organization and, uh, with around 35 different nationalities and three working languages, which are English, French, and German. Their headquarters are in Munich. There you can see a picture of the main building in Munich. 
And they also have offices in Berlin, The Hague, Vienna, and Brussels. They are also under the supervision of the Administrative Council, and they also have their own independent boards of appeal. In fact, they have many different boards of appeal. They have the technical ones, so 28, 28 sorry, technical boards of appeal, then they have the legal board of appeal, uh, the enlarged board of appeal, and even the disciplinary one. Uh, one of the main characteristics of the European patent system is that they, uh, and the main, one of the main advantages, of course, is that through a centralized procedure, uh, they can, and with a single application, they can get to the grant of a European patent. Uh, having said that, uh, the European patent needs to be validated in the selected member states to be enforced at. And that sometimes implies a translation and also the payment of some fees. Uh, so that's why I was, and so that's why in the title, title, sorry, we refer to a bundle of national pay patents because even if after this procedure we get to a European patent, at the end, or oh, only when this is when this European patent is validated in a specific uh, selected member states then it's enforced and it becomes a bundle of national patents. In this respect, once validated, the European patents have the effect and are also subject to the same conditions as national patent. They have an independent life in each country. So it might come to a situation where in one country, patent is enforced and the other not, because there has been a procedure, for example, for annulment, that is a possibility. And also, it is possible to obtain patent protection in 44 countries based on a single application. That's, of course, as I was saying, a clear advantage. And here, no, there is no mistake. It's a, I know that I said that there are 38 member states. Uh, I'm talking about here about 44 countries because farther to the 38 member states, there are also extension states and validating validation states uh, where the protection can be extended. And for example, among the validation states, you can have, uh, for example, Cambodia or even uh, Morocco and Tunisia. The procedure of application, where it starts also with the filing of an application that can be done directly at the EPO, but also at the national patent offices or even using the PCT. Uh, uh, then there is the search of the prior art which is, uh, and then we have here, uh, and after 18 months, the publication of the application. Then there is the examination of the application, which is done this time, which is done in paper. So they're examining the documents. And finally, there is the grant of or refusal of the, of the right. And the requirements. Um, we can say that there are indeed four requirements because first of all uh, there need to be an invention and uh, the same as it happened with the treat where there was no definition of invention also the EPC does not contain a, what is a definition does not define what is an invention uh, it contains however a list of what are not inventions uh, like for example um, um, computer programs uh, discoveries aesthetic uh, productions so those are not to be considered inventions. And also there are some, um, some, uh, some creations that are excluded from patentability. Uh, uh, but further to that, so one, so if, if, the, if the invention is not included in any of those in, in the list of, of that I was mentioned or and it's not excluded from patentability, then we have three requirements to further three further requirements to take into account. First, the invention must uh, need to be new, meaning that it does not form part of the state of the art. And by state of the art, it is to be understood that it's not made available to the public um, before or earlier to the date of application. Also, that it does not involve an inventive step, that is, that is not. Uh, obvious uh, that it was not obvious for a person skilled in the art, and finally that is susceptible of industrial application in the sense that it can be used or made uh, in the industry that includes agriculture. Uh, concerning the effects of the European patent, well, I already said that in fact the rights are determined by the national patent law of the country where it is uh, validated, 
in the sense that it's uh, the EPC does not contain the rights. Normally, uh, the the rights are uh, well the exclusivity rights that prohibit the use in any form of the of the of the invention. But it's it it is also too important to make clear that it does not come from the EPC, but it's the national patent law who defines the rights. The scope of the patent is defined by the claim, by the claims for which uh, protection is sought, and also here drawings and the description in the patent are to be considered. And uh, finally, concerning the protection, while well, the term is 20 years from the date of filing of the application, not from the granting, but from the filing of the application, and there is also the possibility to have provisional protection since the publication of the application. Uh, here as well, uh, some statistics on biotech patents. Uh, this is a very interesting slide because you can see, well, you can find a lot of information here. There are around 300 patent applications for plant-related inventions per year, which is uh, not bad. I know that compared that to the to the total numbers of of the of the EPO, it's not that many. <laughs> it's it's low. Let make it clear. But still, it's it's not bad. And even if we check and uh, all the patents and by technology well it's 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 interesting information here that you can that you can see and finally before leaving the floor to my colleague i would like to make reference to the biotech directive directive 98-44 uh, as this was also with this will also be uh, referred by her uh, in the in the case law it is a directive that harmonizes at EU level national legislation on patentability of invention of biological material. It's interesting to, to, to state that it was incorporated into the EPC in 1990 now. So even if the if the EPO it's uh, or DPO, it's it's not part, it's not an EU institution, they it was implemented uh, with the implementing rules to the EPC to ensure harmony between EU legal order and the European patent system. And the biotech directly, directive sorry, must be used as a supplementary means of interpretation when applying the provisions of the EPC. So with that, I finalize my introduction uh, to the PDR and patent system. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Ms. Martina Lopez. Thank you. Thank you. So, I will uh, take it from here and we are moving to the next uh, section, which is on the interface between plant variety rights and patents. So we are going to see how these two rights are intertwined with one another. So um, to begin with, it's uh, interesting to, to see side by side, um, to compare the eligibility requirements that uh, my colleague has just presented, because there are some of course, there are some differences, but then there are some certain commonalities or like analogies that can be traced between both. So, first of all, again, I recall that the subject matter of protection of a patent is a, a technical invention, whilst uh, the subject matter of protection of a plant variety right is the plant variety. And uh, here, it is also interesting to remark that for patents under patent law, um, plant-related inventions are um, described in the claims um, based on the genotype, whilst uh, for the definition of plant variety right, as we have seen, is uh, rather based on the expression of the characteristics uh, stemming from the genotype, so based on the phenotype. And well, uh, again, we see confronted on the screen the different requirements of the eligibility for both. And uh, here, what's interesting to begin comparing is the requirement of uh, novelty under patent law with the requirement of distinctness in uh, under plant variety rights protection. So the distinctness requirements, um, um, basically uh, it means that a variety is considered or indistinct when it is added to the plant kingdom. And uh, this actually refers or um, we get to this conclusion when we uh, establish that these varieties different from all the um, varieties of common knowledge and here the notion of common knowledge uh, can be um, let's say compared with the prior art or the state of the art under patent law and then um, taking then again this uh, novelty requirement under patent law 
it's also important to uh, distinguish this novelty requirement from the novelty requirement on um, under plant um, plant variety rights uh, law because under uh, for a plant variety right what we check is the commercial novelty so has the variety been uh, commercially exploited for for the purpose of uh, of um, a revenue so here the definition is a narrower than under patent law where as we have seen uh, it, it's a sort of absolute novelty so the invention must not form part of the state of the art now um coming to the to the scope of the right another important element where we need to trace some uh, differences so of course uh, in under both systems you get an exclusionary right uh, that is granted to the holder However, we could say that the scope of the right under a patent law is larger than under a plant right, under a plant variety right. Because why is it so? Well, because there is no equivalent under patent law to the breeder's exemption under plant variety rights law. So this is a fundamental um, difference. And as uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Garcia Monco has already explained, uh, the breeder exemption is a cornerstone in the plant variety rights system. However, um, even if there's no such equivalent on the patent law, there is, however, a limited breeder's exemption in, some, in the patent law of uh, some European jurisdictions. So uh, that is the case of Germany, Netherlands, uh, France, and Switzerland. And um, so what, what is it, this limited breeder's exemption? So um, we need to distinguish, let's say here, uh, two types or two steps. So first of all, there is the developing or the use of material to develop a, a variety. And then we have the commercialization of the variety once we already got to develop a, a new variety. So uh, with the limited breeders exemption, what we have is that the breeders can freely use patented biological material for developing uh, new varieties. And here, what basically the um, authorization of the patent holder is not needed. However, once uh, this variety, uh, sorry, once this um, variety is going to be commercialized, if this new variety includes the patent to trade, then here at this stage, a license or the authorization of the patent holder is needed. And then um, it's also interesting to remark that with this uh, unitary uh, patent that is uh, not yet in force but uh, is foreseen to enter it into force at some stage, um, here, uh, well, this will be a, a patent that will have effect uh, throughout the territory of uh, the participant uh, member states of the European Union. So it's a sort of enhanced cooperation among the states. And here in the unitary patent court agreement, uh, there is actually a limited breeder's exemption that is foreseen, as you see now in Article 27b, uh, reproduced on the screen. Another um, important aspect of comparison, well, that is here the duration of the protection under a patent right and then under a plant variety right. So on the screen, you can see that uh, the period of protection under a patent begins to run from the time when the application for patent protection is filed, and then is, it lasts for 20 years. Whilst in the case of plant variety rights, the protection begins to run from the time of the grant of the plant variety right. And from that moment onwards, it, takes, uh, it lasts for 25 years, or as we have seen, 34 certain species. And again, there is, however, a provisional protection recognized uh, from the moment when the application for the plant variety right uh, has been published. Um, sorry. So um, here um, we it's important now to see uh, what are the exemption exceptions to patentability because there is actually one relating to plant related inventions. And uh, here, uh, the, the main um, article that we are going to analyze in detail is Article 53, Letter B of the European Patent Convention. So um, reading it out loud, so European patents shall not be granted in respect of plant varieties or essentially biological processes for the production of plants. And then there is an implementing rule to the European uh, Patent Convention uh, which develops uh, this article, and this is the implementing rule 28.2. Uh, 
which will also be discussed now. And as you can read in the screen, so under Article 53b, European patents shall not be granted in respect of plants exclusively obtained by means of an essentially biological process. So um, now uh, you may be wondering about the notion of essentially biological process. So actually the, the notion or a sort of definition of this notion has been crystallized in Rule 26. Um, number five of the European Patent Convention to the European Patent Convention, and this is um, the essentially biological process could be defined as the process for the production of plants consisting entirely of natural phenomena. So uh, this uh, means like a conventional methods for producing plants uh, that do not involve the use of technologies to bypass natural biological mechanisms. However, and now you will be wondering why don't we just have the notion of biological process? Why do we have this essentially term there? Well, um, this is because the exception uh, covers the processes which are fundamentally biological, but there can always be like a secondary feature where technical devices are involved. But we are going to see uh, there are some nuances that need to be traced, and we are going to see that in a moment with the case law. So, um, now uh, we come uh, to this uh, fourth section on the case law of the Boards of Appeal of the European Patent Office to see how these uh, articles that I was just commenting have been interpreted by the case law. So, first of all, you can see on the screen a brief outline of the landmark case law saga that we're going to see. So, Novartis in the, in the 90s, then we have uh, Tomato and Broccoli 1 and 2. Uh, because these are joint cases and, and there were two, let's say, uh, rounds of decisions um, in uh, 2010 and then in 2015 they were issued. And then we come to the uh, paper decision um, and finally the latest uh, development, which is the opinion G319 of the Enlarged Board of Appeal. So, uh, beginning with the first, uh, let's say, landmark case here, we have Novartis. So um, here, uh, what the Board of, uh, Board of Appeal um, ruled on was on plant varieties. It confirmed that indeed plant varieties are excluded from patentability. So the, the reasoning on the wording that it's worth reproducing is uh, that a claim where specific plant varieties are not individually claimed is not excluded from patentability, even though it may embrace plant varieties. So what does this mean? Well, it means that plants can be patented as long as the technical feasibility of the invention is not confined to a particular plant variety. So although plant varieties are not patentable as such a subject matter, they can be covered under the scope of a patent. And to see an illustration of this, I've picked this uh, visual scheme from the European Patent Office and uh, here we can see that uh, a specific uh, apple variety, so Golden Delicious, would not be patentable as such. Uh, it contains, uh, in this case, like a, a vitamin, a vitamin C um, trait, but if, uh, a claim cannot be restricted to this variety. However, um, in, um, a patent could be granted uh, for the claim of the vitamin C content that then could be applied in practice to <coughs> several uh, to different varieties. And uh, another illustrative example. So here in the left, we see uh, a plan of varieties or regarded as the phenotype resulting from uh, the genome. And uh, here, so a claim uh, to a plan which is characterized by a feature X, for example, um, could not would not be patentable if this feature X is heritable. But then if we go to the right and we see the example of a gene trait that uh, can be patented, we see that um, a gene edited plant, which is inserted a gene in its genome and this uh, makes it herbicide resistant, um, would not fall under the definition of plant variety because this plant grouping would not be defined by its whole genome but by this individual characteristic, which is the herbicide resistance. And thus, the invention in this case could be patented. 
So um, now we go to um, this second uh, case that I wanted to bring to your attention today, which is tomato and broccoli one. So the first uh, set of decisions. And here the, the focus was placed on essentially biological processes which are excluded from patentability. So um, here um, the, the a large board of appeal of the APO have to, had to rule now on, um, on, on this matter and on, well, on the matter of whether two uh, patent applications uh, should be granted or not because they had been contested on the basis of Article 53 and uh, on whether the, the debate triggered was triggered around whether these were essentially biological processes or not. So uh, you can see on the screen, so there, was a, uh, there were some process claims for a conventional method for the production of uh, tomato fruits, which uh, had uh, reduced fruit water content. And there was a, a step of uh, screening for reduced uh, fruit water content uh, that was indicated by the wrinkling of the fruit skin. And then uh, the other process claims uh, were for uh, another conventional method, in this case for the production of uh, broccoli, with elevated levels of glucosylonate, and it comprised a step where molecular markers uh, were used in two steps to select hybrids. So, um, in this case, uh, the large board of appeal began by stating rather the, the obvious. It found that a process for the producing plants, uh, which contains or consists of the steps of crossing the whole genomes of plants and then uh, selecting the plants, is excluded from patentability uh, because it is uh, regarded as essentially biological within the meaning of Article 53b of the European Patent Convention. So, um, however, a process could be patentable if uh, it comprises an additional technical step which by itself introduces or modifies a trait in the genome. And then uh, the change in the genome does not result from the crossing of the whole genomes. So here, uh, the Board of Appeal had a chance to, to shed light on the definition of essentially biological process. So, uh, the, the board shed light on, on the fact that the word essentially is opposed to purely, and this has a meaning. This indicates that the mere use of a technical device in a process is not sufficient to confer such process a technical character. Because, for instance, a technical step that serves only to enable or to assist the process of person selection should not render such process patentable. And then, uh, for you to have um, an understanding more practical, we have here on the screen some examples of technical steps that do not render a process patentable. So the process remains considered as essentially biological process. So we have here tools to assist with pollination, we have special greenhouses, or we have molecular markers to facilitate uh, trait selection. Now, the case uh, was remitted then to the examining division of the European Patent Office, but then uh, new questions were triggered and then you, uh, therefore the new questions were addressed to the large Board of Appeal for clarification. So in this case, uh, the focus was placed on the products of essentially biological processes. Are these excluded from patentability or not? So in this case, in practice, it, it concerned a product claim for a tomato fruit naturally dehydrated obtained from the essentially biological process. And then we had the product claim for a broccoli plant obtained from the biological process. So here, um, the enlarged Board of Appeal uh, ruled that the patentability exception of essentially biological process had no bearing on the patentability of the products. And uh, the legal grounds, the legal reasoning was uh, turned around the, the fact that uh, Article 53b was an exemption to a general rule, and as such, uh, exceptions must be interpreted in a strict manner. So what was the outcome? That products of essentially biological processes were considered patentable. Now, um, this triggered vivid reactions at the European Union institutional level. So uh, the European Parliament reacted to these uh, tomato and broccoli two decisions uh, by issuing in 2015 a resolution asking the European Commission to clarify the scope of Article 4 of the Biotechnology Directive. 
why Article 4? Well, because this is the equivalent article to Article 53 of the B that we're here discussing. So um, the Commission then uh, took action and adopted in 2016 the Commission notice on the interpretation of certain articles of the Biotechnology Directive, including, of course, Article 4. And uh, here, the Commission affirmed that uh, the European Union legislation's uh, intention was to exclude from the patentability both the uh, essentially biological processes and their products. And uh, here, the European Parliament uh, endorsed the views, and so did the Council of the European Union, which uh, called for an alignment of the European Patent Office practice with the Commission notice. So um, here, um, in the light of all of these uh, developments at EU level, the um, Committee on Patent Law of the European Patent Office issued in 2017 an opinion favorable um, to amend the implementing regulations to the EPC in order to ensure uh, the alignment of uh, the European Patent Convention with the Biotechnology Directive as interpreted in the Commission notice. So it was all about guaranteeing the um, harmonic coexistence, coexistence between the two legal orders, the international, regional, European one on the one hand, and then uh, the, the EU uh, legal order. So here, as a reaction, uh, measures were taken and the Administrative Council of the European Patent Office approved then the introduction of Rule 28.2 which uh, is developing, as I said, Article 53b. So this entered into force on 1 July 2017, and you can see the wording reproduced on the screen, as uh, we already seen. It, um, European patents cannot be granted in respect of plants that are exclusively obtained by means of an essentially biological process. Now, uh, when everything seemed settled, there was another uh, case that uh, came out, which is the case uh, paper, uh, which was issued by the Technical Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office. And here, uh, actually, the validity of Rule 28.2 was questioned because the Technical Board of Appeal considered that this rule conflicted directly with um, Article uh, 53b of the European Patent Convention, as interpreted by uh, the, the large board of appeal in the tomato and broccoli two decisions. And then the technical board of appeal um, recalled that the provisions of the um, EPC must be seen as prevailing over the, uh, the implementing rules. So also the technical board of appeal recalled that it is uh, the enlarged board of appeal um, that is competent for deciding on points of law of fundamental importance within the um, European Patent Organization's um, um, organization, so as a judicial body. And uh, here also, there were also some lines of reasoning where the technical board uh, ruled that the commission notice should be regarded as irrelevant because it had not been confirmed in a legally binding manner. So for instance, by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And um, as a consequence of all of this, the Technical Board considered that the entrance into force of uh, Rule 28.2 had no impact um, and uh, reiterated then the findings that we saw in Tomato and Broccoli 2. So in essence, that the enlarged, uh, sorry, that the products derived from essentially biological uh, processes uh, could be patentable. Now, there was here a situation of an impasse because on the one hand we have a Rule 28.2 and on the other hand we have this uh, new uh, decision by the Technical Board which uh, contests the validity of this rule. So in view of this situation of impasse, uh, in April 2019 and with a view to restore legal certainty for the benefit of the users and for society in general, um, the president of the European Patent Office lodged uh, with the Enlarged Board of Appeal uh, referral G319, so a referral to uh, clarify this situation. So there were two questions uh, that uh, were part of this referral. So the first question was whether Article 53 of the European Patent Convention can be clarified in, in the implementing regulations 
without this clarification being uh, a priori precluded or limited uh, by the interpretation of this article in an earlier decision by the boards. And then uh, more into the substance as a second question, the, the president uh, asked whether uh, the patentability exclusion of uh, essentially biological plants pursuant to Rule 28.2 was in conformity with Article 53b. So here, of course, there were also some um, admissibility um, um, statements uh, that were referred and the large board of appeal, first of all, deemed the referral admissible. And then when it comes into the substance, the, um, the enlarged board of appeal, uh, first of all, rephrased uh, the two questions because they were considered um, in essence to be too abstract and then uh, compile them into a single question. And the question was considering the developments after a decision by the large board of appeal on the interpretation of the patentability exception. Could this exception then apply also to the product of essentially biological processes? So basically it merged a bit like the two questions. And then uh, here, first of all, in the first part of the uh, opinion of the large board, uh, first of all, the large board uh, started by stating that it was not obvious in Article 53b whether the exception should be regarded in a broad or narrow manner. Um, and then uh, the large board of appeal could not find reasons to extend the patentability uh, exception from biological processes to their products. And um, in essence, uh, it uh, endorsed the earlier findings in tomato and broccoli too based on the classic methods of interpretation, so literal interpretation, uh, systemic, uh, teleological, and so on. However, as a second step, um, the large board, um, the large board of appeal um, applied, decided to apply this, uh, the so-called dynamic interpretation method. So what is this method? This method means that a particular interpretation which has been given to a legal provision can never be taken as carved in stone because the meaning of the provision may change or evolve over time. So what does this mean? This means uh, that uh, tomato and broccoli too did not settle once and for all the meaning of Article 53b of the European Patent Convention. And actually, according to the Enlarged Board of Appeal, Rule 28.2 called for a dynamic for the application of this method of dynamic interpretation. So here, the Enlarged Board of Appeal considered that it could not ignore the will uh, of the Administrative Council of the EPO to introduce Rule 28.2. And also, it was also important that most of the contracting states of the European Patent Convention um, had voted in favour of Rule 28.2. Uh, and then many of them had moreover aligned their national provisions to this rule. So in sum, the Large Board of Appeal concluded that the exception of Article 53b also extends uh, from the biological products uh, processes to the products. So in essence, this means that the products of essentially biological processes are not patentable. Then finally, um, also with a view to safeguard the legitimate interest of patent holders and applicants, because there were a few, also it's important to note that there were a few cases pending around uh, 300 with the, um, with the European Patent Office. So um, here, the large board of appeal introduced the so-called ban on retroactivity. So uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, this new interpretation of Article 53b has no retroactive effects on European patents containing claims on essentially biological, uh, the products of essentially biological processes and having been granted before 1 July 2017. And the same applies to uh, European patent applications with these uh, circumstances. So, well, this is a, a graphic uh, for you to visualize uh, clearly what is excluded and what not. So here we see that uh, we are focusing on the claims directed to uh, processes relating to plants. So uh, we see that when a process is an essentially biological process, it should not be patentable. And then here, um, we have the patentability of claims directed to plant-related products. So here is where we need to see whether the claim are directed to plants or plant parts. This is the first question that we need to ask. So if yes, we need to check whether the plant varieties are individually claimed or not. 
because if they are individually claims, we have seen that that is not patentable. But if they're not individually claimed, then we need to ask, are, have they been exclusively obtained by a essentially biological process? And if the answer is yes, then here we need to look at the affecting filing uh, date of the application or at the grant and check if uh, this is before 1 July 2017. And if it's before this date, then it would be patentable. But otherwise, um, these products are not patentable. Well, then, uh, just to mention that um, also the, this, has, this opinion has implications for the disclaimers practice in, um, in the applications for patents. So the um, EPO examination guidelines have been uh, updated accordingly. Uh, and also, uh, we need to take into consideration this ban on retroactivity, as we have seen. So just in, in a nutshell, what, are, what is this disclaimer practice? Well, uh, it consists in that if a technical feature can be achieved both by a technical process and by a biological process, then a disclaimer is needed to exclude this biological process and then to limit the claimed subject matter to the technically produced product. So you can see in the right like an exemption, an exception, and sorry, an example of how this would look like. And um, otherwise, if this disclaimer is not there uh, and there is this situation, then the application could be considered uh, to concern excluded subject matter and would be refused by the examiner. Now, well, this is only to, for you as a wrap-up to visualize uh, the evolution of the case law saga of the Boards of Appeal of the EPO. So we started with uh, uh, the patentability of plant varieties. Uh, we saw that this was not patentable. Then we, uh, the board, uh, the large, well, sorry, the Boards of Appeal reaffirmed that biological processes were not patentable, and then it all started with um, the debate on whether the products could be uh, patentable or not. And we moved from yes to no, from yes to no. Then uh, another wrap up for you to see on the screen what is non-patentable and what is patentable. But of course, this is a simplification because it's far more complex than that. And uh, because it is that complex, actually, it's really helpful to consult the examination guidelines of the European Patent Office. So you can see here on the screen uh, the route that you have to follow if you want to uh, check the, the examples of what is considered as uh, patentable or not. And uh, finally, we move on to the final considerations and I give the floor back to my colleague, Ms. Garcia Monco. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, taking a bit of what my colleague was just mentioning, uh, in particular regarding the uh, biotech directive and and the well the, the EPC uh, uh, the commission intervention on the with the notice well th this shows the importance of uh, communication uh, within between the patent wall and the PDR wall and this is um, translated in the uh, current cooperation in fact there is a bilateral cooperation between the CBVO and the EPO both institutions in fact, started um, with an administrative arrangement signed in 2016 for five years and which has been very recently um, renewed with a new administrative arrangement uh, signed last March, uh, uh, where it is foreseen that cooperation continues for five years. Uh, this arrangement is focused on exchange of data and ensuring of work practices on the use of database and other work tools. So, uh, basically, it's um, that they can have access, especially the patent examiners, to data concerning plant varieties to be taken into account in the search that they are making of the state of the art. But at the end, it's it's in any case, it's essential that this uh, 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 this discussion on on the essential biological uh, process has shown it's essential that there is regular dialogue. Uh, when it gets to protection of plant-related innovation, and that's uh, something that arises when, uh, with this cooperation, uh, where in regular terms, uh, even um, our examiners, our case holders, and the uh, examiners of the EPO meet and can discuss about common, common issues. So this is uh, really important and will play a key role in the coming challenges. So just to, to inform you about, about the existence of, of, this, of this cooperation. 
Uh, and just so finally getting to, to, the, to the conclusions, no? some conclusion of what has been said today in this webinar. Well, first, uh, first conclusion, clear one, is that patents and PBRs have a different scope of protection, even if it's true that sometimes there is uh, points of, of coexistence or points of, of, of um, uh, where both rights have, uh, the, the limits are not, are not always so much clear. Uh, the opinion G3-19 of the Enlarged Court of Appeal of the EPO has brought legal certainty in Article 53B of the EPC, which is, of course, uh, also very important for the industry, uh, for the breeding industry. Um, a link to what I was saying of the in cooperation is necessary to ensure peaceful coexistence. Here there is a mistake of, of both systems. Uh, also, another another important thing, important conclusion to bring back to home, I think, is that transparency and access to genetic material is key. So that's key for new plant breeding in any case. And uh, also that innovation provides <clears throat> means for future-proof plants against threats, which in, in, as I was mentioning at the beginning, in our context of climate change and so many challenges around it is very important that we 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 keep that that the innovation is 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 protected and that it's incentive then there are incentives to promote said innovation for the benefit of the society and with this I, I finalize uh, this webinar thank you thanking everybody and of course we remain here at your disposal for any questions that you may have thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Monserrat and Angela. Actually, we already have 10 questions, so I'm not going to lose any time and uh, go directly to uh, the question part. I, I told you that the interest um, on uh, this topic, I thought, was very high. And uh, um, so, yes, the, there we go. Um, I'll start. Uh, just uh, to make everybody more comfortable uh, because the qu some questions of people that perhaps uh, joined a, a little bit uh, later than the very beginning of the webinar uh, were about uh, slides and recording of today's webinar. So just let me repeat that uh, uh, the slides uh, are going to be available for you in PDF format in a follow-up email later on after the webinar has taken place. So I will prepare it this afternoon. And also the recording link is going to be um, sent um, to you. And then I would leave you to the next questions, starting from, can a plant variety be defined by its genotype? So here I can start. Uh, um, I, th I'm, I think I, I mentioned that. So uh, no, it's, it's the expression of the characteristics of the genotype which define the the plant variety, so the phenotype. It's it's not the genotype. So so for me this is uh, quite clear. It's 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 not the genotype that defines a plant variety, but it's phenotype. So the expression of the characteristics of a particular genotype or even a combination of genotypes. Thank you. Uh, it's the third question: Is it possible to apply for both a EU application and a national one? And I can go on. And no, it's it's not. I mean, it's not possible. You have to. I mean, you have to go for one way or the other. Uh, you might start with a national application and then uh, make it a EU one, but uh, it is it is prohibited, prohibited that there are uh, both applications or both protections in force at the same time. And number four, can a variety denomination be protected later as a trademark? I think we have a webinar dedicated to that, but I'll let you answer. Yes, yeah. and, and this is my colleague who will do that. I can just say very briefly that, yes, of course, I mean, as I, I was also saying at the beginning of the presentation that there are other tools and, and trademark is one of the most used, and it's very common that you have um, uh, varieties which are uh, of course, they have a variety in the denomination that's compulsory, but then also when they are marked, they are, there is a, a trademark that is uh, registered and that is also used. And I would say that a good example is a uh, Crispin variety, which is uh, normally uh, commercialized as well with under the trademark uh, Pink Lady, for example. Um, well, I would add, uh, after this uh, introduction, there is um, actually so 
denominations and trademarks can coexist, but there is a requirement that the denomination must be clearly identifiable when there is in the package or the denomination must be uh, recognized as such by the user. And then uh, regarding this uh, question on whether a given variety denomination can later on be protected by a trademark, this is uh, not possible. So for instance, we have Article 7.1M in the uh, regulation, the EU regulation on trademarks, which prevents this from happening because a variety denomination is, as we already seen, the generic designation for a given variety. And then um, after the, uh, it's important to remark that after the plant variety right has expired, the variety denomination lives on. So it, it has like an, uh, let's say, uh, infinite, uh, um, um, let's say, intention here. And uh, the, the, mono the monopoly actually for a plant variety right is limited to, to a given time. And then um, it would be like, in a way, artificially extending a monopoly by registering a trademark a, by another system. And this uh, is not yet possible with the, the introduction of these uh, new um, legal basis for um, the refusal of trademarks, including a, or consisting of a variety denomination. Thank you very much to both for the answer. Then number five, is the protocol of Nagoya a limitation for plant variety rights ob obtained via the CPVO? No, it is. Uh, it's, uh, we don't. Yes, we don't. We don't see it as a limitation exactly. because uh, there are different legislations, and everything is supposed to be designed in a way that uh, uh, there is a coexistence between uh, legislations. But uh, there is no, no limitation, as we see it in the Nagoya Protocol. Thank you. And number six, uh, on a given species or group of species, for example, ornamental species, is it possible to access to the list of patents targeting breeding methods and variety as product of the said methods? Uh, I think the ESA, UCID Association, published a list on their website years ago. Um, um, well, here I can I can answer that uh, actually the um, Euroseeds, uh, formerly known as the European Seed Association, uh, has launched a private uh, initiative, uh, which is in order to ensure transparency precisely on this matter of the interface between uh, patents and plant variety rights, and in order for any any breeder to understand whether a given trade is covered by a patent or not. So they launched this initiative, which is called the Pinto database. And then in this database, uh, the users can, well, this database uh, consists of voluntary contributions or of information by um, the readers. And then in this database, it is possible to carry out search, uh, searches by species or um, by, by given names, just to see whether a given uh, a trade is, is covered or to check the, the patents that are existing uh, on in the matter of plant related inventions. Thank you. There was also a comment, this is in the first example uh, that was uh, made at the beginning of uh, the presentation um, when the two patents were taken. So you forgot to mention that a patent is not to, to be granted if the claim subject matter is directed to a specific plant varieties or specific plant varieties. Um, the the viewer uh, is asking whether it's so. Yes, I mean it is an uh, yes, it is one of the I, because I don't know if it refers to my part of the presentation. I mean I was making reference at a certain point to the definition of invention that there are some uh, it is a negative definition and then there are some exceptions to patentability and of course uh, the fact that uh, that uh, plant varieties uh, they are excluded from patentability and then it was also something uh, pointed mm -hmm. out by my colleague when in her part of the presentation when she was mentioning that it was excluded from patentability Novartis case. It was actually yeah. the Novartis case that yes. uh, clarified it's, this. It's just that the question yes, came okay. before yeah. the, yeah. Uh, the uh, okay. explanation. I just wanted to make sure that we clear the doubt of uh, the participants. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And question number eight, how do you apply provisional protection in relation to the rights obtained after grant in the case of infringement that occur during the PVR application process and the act of infringement happens only during the application phase? The act does not happen after the grant of the PVR. If the act does occur during the application process and after the grant, how would you apply the infringement on the infringer based on PVR law? Thank you. So, so here I can just, um, if you want to complement, please go on. I can start by saying that it's not up to the office to 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 deal with those in uh, provisional protection and the infringement because this is dealt with uh, by the national court. So. The provisional protection works in the following manner. So once uh, the application is published and until the granting of the right, uh, the potential title holder uh, has the possibility to ask for a compensation of any damages that might occur during that frame time if afterwards, of course, the title is granted. So if the title is granted, then there is a possibility to, to claim for damages for any act that it will be considered as an infringement of the right, uh, and of course, the right must be granted. So this can be put in place, so this can be enforced before the national courts only once the title has been granted. So uh, so the, the, the idea is that you once the title is granted, if those acts have occurred uh, in the, that frame time, time, even if afterwards, they do not occur anymore, there is a possibility to ask for, for a compensation of the damages for that frame time. So from, that, from the application, from those acts, from the application until the grant, even if afterwards they don't to go on, that's, uh, that's okay. Of course, then probably it will be a, a question of, of evidence of how to prove them, but um, this is something to be dealt in front of the national courts uh, in an infringement procedure. Thank you. Um, then there's a question regarding the slides where it was mentioned that uh, the three particular uh, methods uh, were not uh, protectable by uh, plant variety rights uh, and one of them uh, was the uh, molecular markers. Uh, the um, participant here is asking whether these molecular markers, markers themselves uh, might be potentially patented. If um, if this is a technical process as such, mm -hmm. then uh, maybe I would uh, perhaps invite participants to come to the biotechnology webinar where we're going to have a patent attorney there, <laughs> which is specialized yes, in markers and so on. I, I also <laughs> wanted to stress that that yes. I think this is too concrete as an as a question yes. for for us to be answered. So I think it's better that we don't provide any mm -hmm. specific Correct. answer because it falls outside our knowledge. No, in, we're going to have in a few weeks, I think, uh, intellectual property and biotechnology with uh, Sebastian Tegetov there. And he yeah, is a specialized sure. patent attorney. And if you'd like to come to the webinar, he's certainly going to be happy to answer this question. Um, then question number 10, a little bit longer, saying that the breeders' exemptions in patents and plant varieties uh, are different is misleading. Ah, that's a comment more than a question, is misleading. Mm -hmm. In the country where it is available, the breeders' exemption in patents and PVP are the very same, allowing breeding with a protected variety and only breeding. The apparent difference with regard to commercialization comes from the nature of the subject matter covered by each rights. PPPs are limited to varieties, and when creating a new variety, the new variety usually falls outside the scope of the initial PPP, subject to possible EDV, though, where the authorization for commercialization would also be required. Patents cover a trait or a characteristic applicable to several plant varieties, which has the consequence that if the new variety still contains the patented trait, it falls within the patent scope and requires authorization for commercialization. I have to say I haven't understood this comment very much, but if you'd like to say something about it very gladly, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Well, uh, yes, uh, thank you for the nuance. Uh, what, uh, what, I, what we try to convey in our, our message is that uh, there is no uh, fully fledged breeders exemption under the patent law systems. But there is, however, as we have seen, a limited uh, breeders exemption. And uh, here there is indeed, uh, it is restricted to the use of the biological material to develop the new variety. And then um, in the case of commercialization, then uh, a license or an authorization would be required from the holder. And uh, that's it. Thank you. And going on, if company do not sell seeds of their variety, but only use these seeds to grow themselves plant therefrom, and subsequently sell the harvested material from these plants. What is the, val the added value of applying PVP? Because PVP only protects uh, commercialization of seed and propagated material. So I think the question here, for example, if I have some crops and and I think I grow them from uh, the protected seeds of the variety and then I just uh, sell uh, the yield so what what I get from from my crops and um, the harvested material and and theoretically I can do that there is no limitation then why are people filing for plant variety protection in these cases I think this is more or less the question Ah, but also harvested, harvested material is protected. Not only yep. um, variety constituents or propagating material is protected, so also harvested material. So that's that's the thing. That's why I was mentioning the scope covers both. It's true that uh, variety constituents is it's wider. Uh, there, are, in order to protect harvested material, some specific conditions must apply. Like for example, that you have uh, before you have gone or you have um, informs your right uh, concerning the variety constituent, for example, uh, and it was not possible. So, but in any case, uh, for me, that would be a case where the harvested material would be protected. So that would be the advantage of protecting the plant yes. variety well. That's what I think too. Then freedom to operate. Uh, is there any database where we can search plant variety by their distinguishing distinguishing features, similar to what we do with patents, something like a space net, but for plants variety, plant varieties? Well, um, a first remark uh, to be made here in terms of uh, freedom to operate is that, as we mentioned, there is a, this corner store in our system, which is the breeder's exemption. Uh, based on which any breeder can use existing plant material protected under a plant variety right and then uh, use it to develop a new variety and then protect it and commercialize it and no authorization would be needed except in some specific cases and I saw that this was mentioned in a comment when there is like an uh, essentially uh, essentially um, the right variety and then for commercialization there is an authorization required and so on but this is a bit technical for the um, presentation today and we're not uh, addressing it but this is the first point that this uh, this freedom to operate is, is not a notion that uh, we have really as in patent law because there is this exemption and then in any case regarding uh, databases of course we have a public register where anybody can check uh, the um, applications for community plant variety rights that have been lodged and then you can see the registered rights and then at the same time, we also have another uh, tool, which is called the Variety Finder. And then uh, there you can search varieties by means of their, by checking their, by, well, by introducing as keyword, well, the denomination. Thank you. And for the question on patent, if a competitor develops a new variety, for example, in Germany, France, or the Netherlands, using patented biological material but only commercializes the new variety after the expiration of the patent does this competitor escapes this patent completely based on the limited breeders exemption 
uh, well, the the patent, if it's not in force, of course, it it is. Uh, if it has expired, there is no problem with the uh, with the commercialization of of the variety because the the patent is is not in force anymore. So the right is not in force. I guess it goes more through the development development of the of the new variety uh, with the limited breeders ex exemption. And I would say that uh, yes, uh, that would be that would be that would be the case. Because it's uh, if it if it's developed um, if it's developed uh, in a place where the where there is, is in the patent law this limited breeder exemption which allows the development of, of of new varieties then for the development there will be no problem and once uh, and if the commercialization is done once the patent has expired I see I would say that I don't see any problems with uh, with any kind of infringement. Thank you. And uh, is chemical mutagenesis or mutagenesis by radiation also considered as a technical step that can modify, introduce a trait in the genome and therefore be patentable? Perhaps mm -hmm. also this is a quite te technical question, but if you'd yes. like to give an answer anyway. I have, yeah, I have a short uh, answer to that. So the point is then uh, to look at uh, the human intervention so, uh, well, here and, and how technical is this human intervention? So, in this case, um, because there is this uh, chemical mutagenesis that uh, causes a change actually inside the genome of a plant, then uh, this, this is a situation that would be covered under patentability. And also, uh, I would also like to say that, for instance, uh, random mutagenesis is covered as a process that can be patentable. Thank you. I'm trying to copy the next um, couple of questions. One, one second. Um, it says uh, there are currently about 20 patents pending on resistance to the Jordan virus in tomatoes. What should a breeder do if he wants to breed for this resistance? Uh, should he ask all patent holders in advance for a license, even though he does not know whether his breeding will be covered by the patent? Or does he have to carry out expensive analysis himself to find out whether his new varieties are affected? The effort for this is enormous. Well, these these are complex situations that yeah, need to be yes. analyzed in detail with yes. other circumstances. It's not easy to to provide a, a solution yes. right away. Uh, I, I yeah. agree that it, it therefore seems enormous. Yes, but mm -hmm. I I would also advise to have a, a legal expert, probably a, also a patent attorney, uh, to provide advice on patentability because this is really. Uh, a case that I would say again goes far away from our our mm -hmm. our knowledge and competence to to provide an answer to that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and finally, would chromosome doubling to obtain a polyploid variety in order to obtain a new trait express in a variety be patentable? Again, this is a bit technical, and even though I, I have a feeling I don't want to just uh, say something wrong, but what I would recommend here is to check again the examination guidelines of the European Patent uh, Office, because there you can see concrete examples, and uh, it's quite technical, and then there um, this can bring an answer to this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's 12 o'clock precisely. So we've been very, very, very efficient with time. And uh, also, uh, although actually we have a large amount of questions because there were 15 uh, questions, I'd like to thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Monserrat and Angela for the very interesting presentation and for answering uh, all the questions uh, until the end. Uh, thank you very, very much to both of you for, for being with us today.
Thank you. Thank you. And also, thanks a lot to all participants. Uh, still 65 uh, together with us at 12 o'clock. It's uh, very, very, um, let's say, good result uh, for us. And uh, it shows uh, the large interest uh, that, uh, that was behind uh, this webinar topic. Uh, myself, I was very interested in uh, this particular topic. So thank you for staying until the end. You're going to receive all necessary information and all useful uh, links and uh, PDF uh, as soon as possible. And if you'd like to, I showed you when the next appointment with the CPVO are uh, in the next upcoming month. So we're going to be, I'm going to be very happy to sit together again with you. Uh, another morning talking about plant variety uh, protection. If you'd like, you can join us also in all other webinars are so for the European IP help desk. We're going to be very happy to welcome you. Thanks a lot and I wish you a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much again and goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>